to Off the Shelf. I'm your host, Yvonne Wolf, and today our special guests are Ivy and Tom Sundell. They are authors of many books. I met them at a holiday bazaar at Glenbrook South High School in 2019. Welcome, Ivy. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. I'm enjoying the, the ride. Ivy, let's start with your work behind the compilation of Living Artists. It's a very visual book. Yes, uh, Living Artists is my third Chicago Fine Arts book that I edited and published. The process was the same as the first two books, which is to find respected curators in the Chicago area to serve as jurors. And then they would rank the submitted slides of artwork in terms of originality, composition, technique, and emotional appeal. Mm. Then I would take their top 50, you know, 60 to 70 artists and put them in the book. The three jurors for living artists were John Bernetti, who is the curator for Evanston Art Center, Dominic Mullen, who is the associate curator for the Museum of Contemporary Art, and Marion Richter, who is the curator for the Union League Club of Chicago. Mm -hmm. I chose them because of their different perspective on art. I found the artists through ads in the Chicago Artists Coalition, art fairs, art galleries, and a lot of word of mouth. I see. And originally I had planned a whole series of art books so they would have the same title mm, and yes. like one, two, and three. But my first book was titled The Chicago Art Scene. And at the time I had a hard time placing them in orders in Barnes and Noble art section mm. because of the title. What they told me that the, because the first word of the title is Chicago, they want to put it in the Chicago tourist section. Right, I see. And so then my second book, I switched the name around, changed the format a bit, and I called it Art Scene Chicago 2000. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that they didn't like that either. They thought that with the Chicago word anywhere in the title, they have to put it right. in the Chicago section. Uh, so that's why my third book is called Living Artists. Yes. It is also a book of fine arts of the Chicago area artists. Well, that's very important for our audience to know that how you title it can put it in the correct or the wrong category. So that's a very good tip. Now, Ivy, I must imagine that this is a hard decision to make. Which visual artists or which living artists will you put in and which ones will have to be, I have to wait for next year? How do you deal with the ones that, let's say, don't fit in this year? Well, I had three art books and there were people who resubmitted in the subsequent books and got admitted. I see. That's a, that's a good way to keep going. Then you always have another book. Yeah, I also have different jurors each time so that each time it, it's sometimes a different perspective on people's art. That sounds like a very worthwhile project and to spotlight also our local artists. The North Shore scene is very prolific with artists and illustrators. Let's talk a little bit about you, Tom. You wrote A Bloodline of Kings, a novel of Philip Macedon. Can you tell us more about that? Certainly. Um, first off, for those unfamiliar with Philip, uh, he's the father of Alexander the Great, and he is the one who uh, made Macedonia a power. And what interested me was his rise to power. Mm. So uh, in that instance, I had done a, a prior work uh, on him. It was a game, actually, that was published in a magazine. And uh, that gave me the military aspects of his, of his life. Um, but in in focusing on him, I became more interested in uh, how he 
he rose to power. And that required a fair amount of research, of preparatory research, um, about a year and a half of understanding the chronology of events and the individuals and mm -hmm. the setting, the, the place and time. Uh, and then, of course, as you're writing, there's additional research as you solve problems. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know much about horses and I had to learn about horse care. Ah, I didn't yes. know much about the economics of goat herding. So I oh. had to learn about that. So in my experience, no matter what the genre is, whether it's contemporary or set in the past, you need to do research. Oh, fascinating. Very true, Tom. This is really a good topic because most of the people like to look at the hero like Alexander, right, the king. They don't look at his upbringing and what he received from his previous generations. And these historic novels, as I understand it, take extensive and years of research. How many years did you spend on learning about goats herding and, uh, and the economy of horses, right? Horses were a huge part of our economy before sure. in the past. Uh, as I said, it was about a, a year and a half of research and then five years of writing. I see. Um, and I interrupted it at one stage, but uh, Philip came in a dream and told me to get, get back on duty. Ah, that's perfect. Well, sometimes we do have to put things away to really pick out what's important to write and organize that type of information. Yes. Tom, give us three tips you have for our writer audience on doing research for historic novels. It can be daunting. There's an old adage to write what you know. Um, I don't find that useful. I like write what interests you. Mm. And in the case of me, that's history. Um, and that history can be not simply distant past, but more recent past. So if I'm writing a story, for example, I wrote a novel, Lawyers, Guns and Money, set in 1976 in Honduras, Bahamas, um, various locales in the US, Hong Kong, and Amsterdam. I have been in a number of those places and I've certainly lived through 1976, but you still needed to know a lot of research about time. Maybe it's the weather, maybe it's something mm. else. It's make that not only true, but believable so that your characters come alive and comes alive and the plot makes sense. Thank you. I think that's a very valid point and helps us learn to explore what we don't know. Now, how do you inspire each other as writers? Well, when Ivy was first uh, wanting to do something within the art community, I suggested a book uh, as a way of, of introducing herself into that community uh, because she already had familiarity with the publishing process. Um, and then in terms of my book, Bloodline, she not only published the book initially, but uh, she was the lead in marketing, gaining testimonials from uh, established authors like Bernard Cornwell, um, arranging interviews with the press, arranging book signings, uh, entering the book in, uh, in a contest. So it became a, a finalist for historical fiction for the uh, book sell, uh, book, Independent Book uh, Publishers Association. Uh, so she was instrumental in the success of that particular book. Wow. Now, marketing is no small project. I mean, this book marketing is its own kind of a monster. So Ivy, how you have your own publishing company, Crow Woods. Tell us how you started that. Well, um, when I first, in, in 1997, um, at the time, I didn't think that any publishing company would take on such a large project and publish a local art book mm. um, written by an unknown author. And so having my own publishing company was really the best decision I made. Um, I, at the time, we were living in Evanston across from a park with lots of crows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, 
this was before the West Nile disease decimated the crows. Mm. And so we got that idea that we, it could be called Crow Woods. Very cool. Um, I was clever. able to find a distributor right off for my first book and got it into bookstores and libraries. Then I arranged for gallery exhibits for all the artists in each book and, and book signings. And I tried to accompany each one with um, newspaper articles, online reviews, mm. and um, also uh, any kind of radio talk show interviews. Yes, so yes. in that sense, it was successful. Um, the first time I saw my book in a two-page spread in the Sunday edition of the Chicago Tribune, I thought I had it made. I thought, wow, I don't have to do anything more. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that book selling isn't that easy as just getting it in the news. It is a lot of hard work to sell thousands of copies. Yes. But this... Wonderful, Ivy. That looks like your personality. You just like to outreach to people and you like to learn new ways to work on marketing. Right now, when you talk about social media and getting into new forms of media, that takes so much learning for all of us. Yeah. Um, my newest book, Visions of Life 2, was released during the pandemic. And of course, I couldn't arrange for any kind of in-person event. So then I looked at Zoom meetings and other things that would bring the author and artist to the public. So then my daughter was one who was really into Inst Instagram and I learned how to use the Zoom sessions to um, record six to eight minute sessions for my author and artist mm -hmm. for each story so that they can kind of interact and appreciate each other's work. And then I would post it on Facebook and then I take one minute segments of each and put them in and, and I add subtitles and then put them in to Instagram. Yes. They're Fantastic. all available. Sorry. They're, they're, okay all available through crowdspublishing.com if any of your readers and any of your audience wants to take a look at it. That's fantastic, Ivy. That's the kind of role model we need. We need somebody to lead the way. These Zoom interviews are new to all of us. I'm glad to hear that you're learning to use Instagram, which has shorter, what they call shelf life, but they say that books need to reach out to a greater public, younger uh, generation. Mm -hmm. So Tom, tell us a story about how life inspired the fiction in your novel. Okay, I'll, I'll take an example from a recent book. Um, in 2019, we traveled down to the Tampa Bay area, to St. Petersburg and, and Tampa. And that setting inspired a novel I completed last year, Tampa Bay. Um, near our hotel, I was walking through in a, a business park and uh, I noticed a mediation services sign. And that gave me my protagonist. I decided a mediator as a protagonist would be involved in all different kinds of situations. Um, similarly, we were at a restaurant and uh, I noticed um, a lovely young lady uh, out with an older uh, gentleman, uh, obviously romantically involved, and uh, decided that that would be an element that would play in the, in the novel as well. So from observation, that's where I gather some of what I use. But there's also your own personal life. Now, my, my mother, for example, suffered from schizophrenia. Ooh. And so um, as a result of that, while I don't necessarily use it directly, it does inform how I think about writing about a character. So the, the protagonist in Tampa Bay is prone to depression. Mm. So that plays it out. In another novel I finished last year, A Viennese Waltz, the... Um, the protagonist is a werewolf who wants to lead a normal life 
and becomes involved with the daughter of his employer, but mm. she's slow of mind. Oh. Uh, so that, that played a part in it. <laughs> Very creative characters, Tom. I'm really excited to introduce our audience to your books. Ivy, for publishing your own books, the cover you have for the living artists and visual artists, do you hire a graphic artist or a graphic designer or do you do some of this visual work yourself? Well, I am really one of your ultimate do-it-yourselfers. <laughs> I do my own layout in Park Express. I design the covers and the dust jackets. Uh, when I first started my first book, I had the printers uh, scan in all the slides. And I've always had a hard time conveying to them that the colors need to be richer or warmer tone. Mm. It's, it's blue, but it's not the right blue. Mm, <laughs> it needs yes. to be a little warmer. <laughs> and it's really hard to, to do that. But by the time I published Living Artists, I discovered that I can do it myself. I can get a machine and, and scan in all this, the artwork. And at that time it would be slides and transparencies. Yes. And that way I have a lot more control over having the, the image match the original artwork. And for Tom's front cover, I hired uh, an artist who was featured in my first two art books, James Mess Play. And he did a wonderful job um, illustrating, basically painting a scene from the novel. That's beautiful. Ivy, I can tell you are a woman of many talents and a woman of many interests. I'd love to talk to you more after our program. And so for Tom, have you received any feedback from your readers? Uh, yes. Um in a couple senses. Um, in the past, I often would have a beta reader, uh, someone who would read my novels and give me uh, comments and so forth. For example, David Kasselwitz, who was once on your program, yes. uh, was one of my beta readers. Um, uh, more recently, uh, I'm a member of the Off-Campus Writers Workshop. Uh, the Soters, for example, that you mentioned earlier are members as well. Wonderful. And uh, uh, I'm a, from an offshoot of that. I'm in a critique group of seven of us and we critique each other's works uh, with the constructive intent of improving them. Um, and so I, I have a sort of built in set of, of feedback. And then there's, of course, uh, I, I published my work now online in my blog, which is sundellwritings.wordpress.com. And of course, there I get likes and comments from the readers. Um, and then Almost finally, instantly, uh, right? Sorry. Right. Uh, and then finally on Amazon uh, for the bloodline, um, there you can see reader reviews uh, and they simply pour in. <laughs> That's wonderful. Do you enjoy the, the emotional response? Do you enjoy feeling or hearing from your readers? Uh, certainly. Um, and, and I've been able to improve my writing and improve my, my novels through that effort. Um, one of the advantages of not being in print but being online is I can quickly change things and put it back up and be out there available to the public again. Uh, so, yeah, I am very responsive. Oh, that's very true. I've heard of another guest of ours who noticed from his readership, he misspelled whiskey with, with an E or without an E. And that itself had an uh, impact on the meaning of it. So that was very interesting, the things that we can learn from our readers. It sounds like it's a, it's a wonderful journey that we are all on, that we actually have common writers that we know on the program, Salters and the... So how has the writing brought you two together in your marriage? Should Ivy go first? Oh, I was going to let Tom, let Tom? answer that. Okay, let Tom. <laughs> well, uh, again, 
we encourage each other in our endeavors. Um, but it's, it's really a matter of allowing each one to have space and time to pursue those, those cultural and, and artistic interests. Um, we always come together at mealtime. We come together other times, but we also allow ourselves lots of space to do our individual projects. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, we have two daughters, uh, and I think we've both been examples to them um, mm -hmm. in terms of their, their lives. And that has shown up in the art of our daughters and their writing, et cetera, mm. as well. Yes. Ivy? I wasn't going to add to it? that. I think okay. I said it all. It's okay. I did have something about your previous question about the audience. Please. Uh, because the audience of my books are the general public. And what I want to do is bring fine arts to people outside of the art circle, mm -hmm. and, which I think is relatively small. So when I first started my book, my art book, I didn't know who Ed Peschke was. And I couldn't even pronounce his name. It was so embarrassing. I went to his studio to ask if he can write a review of the book and I showed him my draft and he was gracious enough to overlook all my ignorance and asked to be in the book. Mm -hmm. So he turned out to be the one, the one artist who wasn't juried in, in all of my art books. Oh. Uh, it was such an honor. I didn't even realize that at the time. Uh, I want the public to get really excited about local artists or work mm. of living artists because they can seek them out and purchase their work they can commission their work uh, they can do so much with the artists that's so true i think that's very commendable bring art to the general public we see some of that at public library your lobbies and i think that we need to not make art so intimidating or so exclusive I also like what Tom said about creativity, the role of creativity in your marriage, in your lives. When you work on something creative, it, there's no one answer. So you, you really need to give each other room to explore different answers. So I think that's a very important lesson that you share with us here today. Now, what is your message for our authors out there? Maybe there's more. Since I'm the editor publisher of Visions of Life series, uh, my, my message to writers who are submitting work to a publisher is that if you can work with the editor, oftentimes you have a much better chance of getting published than if you refuse to. Mm -hmm. We have some authors who are very protective of the work and yes. refuse to make any change to the initial submission. Right. Um, for me, if it has been such an absolute joy to work with some of these authors and so that they can rewrite the story and have a more credible plot mm -hmm. and a voice that the audience can relate to. Yes. So it, it just make it so much better um, as, as a collection of stories than if they just dismiss the whole idea that, that the initial yeah. story wasn't written well enough. Or changes and, are necessary to bring the story better, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point, Ivy. That's a really good advice for authors because authors can be artists as well and they become very concerned about any changes to to their work. Tom, do you have a message for our authors out there? Certainly. Um, first thing is an author should be a well-rounded reader. Read widely, um, learn from your reading, uh, and apply that learning to what you write. The second thing is Keep track of your own ideas, have a notebook or something, 
uh, jot down your thoughts and, and uh, I, uh, observations. And then the third thing is write. I mean, write every day. Uh, that's how you improve. Um, some of it is trash and gets watered up and thrown away, but some of it becomes gems. So write every day. Thank you very much for being here, both of you. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. And thank you for watching. Join us next time on Off the Shelf. Mm -hmm.